let us go in the house of the Lord. I was led when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. We are here, Dr. Litseli, ready to receive the word from above. So it is over to you, my dear leader. Thank you very much, uh, Sister Rinolda. Uh, that has been kind of you to, to lead out. I'm, I'm happy to be part of this, and I believe that the Lord is going to bless us as we share his word together. Now, if you notice, we have been telling stories. Uh, we, we have been telling stories, but this is, a, a, this is one story which has quite a number of stories within. It's actually one story, and, and other stories are simply explaining the other aspects of the main story. The main story is God leading us from Eden to the new Jerusalem. It is the story of God dealing with the problem of sin in our lives. It is the story of how God has sustained us. It is the story that will end with us sitting with God, asking him questions, asking him to explain how he handled the, our lives and the question of sin, the difficulties that we, we, we faced on, on this earth, how he handled the matter of Satan and sin together with his followers, how he handled minor details in our lives. Now, I'm told from the book, the, the, this Bible says to me, uh, after we have had that session of asking questions on how God handled our lives and the story of others. I'm told, let me read a passage, that all of us, after having heard or received God's explanation, all of us will sit down and utter a song or sing a song. I'm reading Revelation 15 verse 3. It says, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, now notice to the, to, the, to the words of the song, great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Now notice the next sentence, just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Maybe let me, let me end there. After hearing the story, after asking God, why did you allow this to happen to me? Why did you allow Corona to do this? Why did you allow this? Why did you? Everyone will have a question. I'm told from this passage that after God had answered all the questions, we are going to look at him and say, just and true are your ways, O God. Now, if we say just and true are your ways of God, we are actually uttering judgment. We are saying you have been just in handling this problem. Now, I'm looking forward to listening to his answers because his answers are not provided here. But we are promised that after he had answered our questions, after he had wiped our tears, we are going to sing and say, just and true are your ways. I want to challenge you to be there so that you can listen to the answer to your question and the, the answers to other questions. This morning, I want us to go to the another story, yet another story, part of the bigger story. And the topic for this morning is God's wondrous grace in our lives. God's wondrous grace in our lives. I'm going to read a, a few passages, and after that, we will reflect on those passages. Okay, we're going to read, uh, uh, I think it's going to be three or four passages. After that, we will reflect, then we will go to the session of prayer. The first one is going to be Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 38 and 39. These are the teachings that Moses gave to the Israelites. He said to them, now you face other nations more powerful than you, you are. But the Lord has already started forcing them out of their land and giving it to you. Now notice the, the next verse. Moses says to them, so remember that the Lord is the only true God, whether in the sky above or on the earth below. Now let, 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 we're going to read the second passage. 
comes from the book of Joshua chapter 2, verse 9 to 13. This is the, the confession of Rahab. Rahab is going to feature in our story this morning. Rahab's confession of faith that saved her family. Now, this is, that, this is the speech of her Rahab. I know that the Lord has given is Israel this land. Everyone shakes with fear because of you. Verse 10, we heard how the Lord dried up the Red Sea so you could leave Egypt. And we heard how you destroyed Sihon and Og, those two Amorite kings east of the Jordan River. 11. Now notice, notice this, the way I've highlighted. We know that the Lord your God rules heaven and earth, and we have lost our courage and our will to fight. Now notice what, what Moses taught the Israelites, the Israelites in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 39. So remember that the Lord is the only true God, whether in the sky above or on earth below. Notice Rahab repeats the same, the same sentence that was uttered by, by, by Moses. Verse 12, please promise me in the Lord's name that you will be as kind to my family as I've been to you. Do something to show that you won't let your people kill my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters and their families. Now, uh, here's another story, Joshua chapter 7, I'm going to read that, that, that passage, then after that we're going to, uh, we'll read the, the other part. This is Joshua 7, 19 to 21, three, four verses. Achan, Joshua said, the Lord God of Israel has decided that you are guilty. Is this true? Tell me what you did and don't try to hide anything. Verse 20, it's true, Achan answered. I sinned and disobeyed the God of Israel. Now notice verse 21. While we were in Jericho, I saw a beautiful Babylonian robe, 200 pieces of silver and a gold bar that weighed the same as 50 pieces of gold. I wanted them for myself. So I took them. I dug a hole under my tent and hid the silver, the gold and the robe. Joshua had some people run to Achan's tent where they found the silver, the gold, and the rope. 25. Joshua said, Achan, you caused us a trouble, a lot of trouble. Now the Lord is paying you back with the same kind of trouble. The people of Israel then stoned to death Achan and his family. They made a fire and burned the bodies together with what Achan had stolen and all his possessions. 26. They covered the remains with a big pile of rocks, which is still there. Then the Lord stopped being angry with Israel. That's how the place came to be called Trouble Valley. Now, the last passage that we're going to be reading, it's Romans 5, verse 19. Adam disobeyed God and caused many others to be sinners. But Jesus obeyed him and will make many people acceptable to God. May God continue to bless the reading of his word now and forevermore, amen. Now we are, we are, we are going to be looking at the passage, this, this passage, the passages that we have read. Uh, remember, this is one story. This is one story. Yesterday we read the story of Abraham and, and uh, the story of Abraham, it's also part of the story that we're going, we will be reading. This is what the, the, the focus of today is the story after the story that happened uh, in, 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 in the book of Genesis chapter 19, or maybe chapter 18 and 19, the stories that we focused on yesterday. So this is the story that took place uh, during the time of Moses. Actually, Moses, before they journeyed to Jericho, Moses teach, taught the children of Israel, and he said to them, I want you to learn that God is going to give you a land. And, and when, when God was giving them a land, it was not just for me giving, giving them land. It was a bigger story. The story was, actually, the story started in the book of Genesis chapter 1, where God promised that the seed of a woman will come and crush the head of the snake. Actually, God was, was promising the birth of the Messiah. So the children of Israel had a mandate. They were given the responsibility of hosting the Messiah. 
The reason why God was giving them a venue, he wanted to give them a venue where they could stay there and then host the Messiah. This was the nation that was chosen to do two things, to keep to be the depositaries of God's oracles, of God's teachings, of the story of the tabernacle, the story of the sanctuary, the story of how God is saving humanity. And also they were to host the Messiah. So they had an awesome responsibility. So that's why God protected them. They were not important simply because they were Israelites. No, actually they were a bunch of slaves. God chose the slaves to host the Messiah. He became their strength. So this is one story from Genesis until the book of Revelation. Now let's come to our story. Uh, Moses had taught them that they should know that God rules up in the sky and God rules down here on earth. And, and, and uh, you'll remember the story in Joshua chapter two. That's, uh, there are two stories that are in jo Joshua, in the book of Joshua. There is a story in Joshua chapter two, the story of Rahab. And there is also a story in chapter seven, the story of Hachan, Achan. Now you can think that these stories are misplaced. You may wonder why do we have these stories in the Bible? But I want to suggest to you that these stories are placed there for a purpose. God is trying to teach his wondrous grace to us, how he works with us, how he deals with the problem of sin, how he deals with the problem of our salvation. Now, with the story of Joshua, the story of Rahab in Joshua chapter 2, here's the lady, Rahab. I'm not going to get into the profession that she was involved in, but she was a resident, a citizen of Jericho. And you'll remember they, they sent the spies to go and spy the land and she hosted the spies. And just before the spies went to sleep, uh, Rahab approached them and she said to them, you know what, I, I know about you. I know you guys are Israelites. Actually, we have heard about you. You, you, you think we don't know anything about you. We have heard about how God led you. We know your God. We know how you crossed the Red Sea. We know how God opened the way for you. We know how God rescued, rescued you from the Egyptians. We know, we actually know that there is a God who rules heaven and earth. And because of those stories, we melted with fear. You know, we have been he hearing these stories for the last 40 years. We were following your stories. And whenever we heard those stories, we melted with fear because of those stories. But I want you to make a promise to me. When you come and take this, we know that this place, Jericho, has been given to you, to you. But please promise me, when you come here, please rescue me and my family, my brothers, my sisters, my, the, the rest of my, and together with their families. And they made that commitment. Now. That's where the story ends. Now let's go to another story in Joshua chapter seven. Now in Joshua chapter seven, the children of Israel are now taking over Jericho. Remember the, two, the, the, the spies made a promise to Rahab that Rahab, we promise you, when we come to take over this city, we are going to save you and your family. So she's, she waited. Now for her to be, to harbor, the spies was actually treason. It was treason against the people of Jericho. And she took a risk because she believed the story that she had heard about the God of Israel. Her belief in God was stronger than the fear of committing treason or betraying her very country. Actually, she now believed in the power of the God of Israel, more than the trust they had on the walls of Jericho. She believed that the God of Israel was stronger than their military power. She believed that the God of Israel was stronger than their gods. She believed that the God of Israel could do anything and that he ruled over the heaven and over the earth. Now they arrived to do, in, in Joshua, Joshua chapter seven, they came, you all know the story, they attacked Jericho, they saved the family of Rahab. 
But now in the process of attacking uh, Jericho, you all know, I will not get into the, the details on how the military, how they attacked Jericho. They had to go around seven times, but they managed through the help of the Lord. Actually, it was God's battle because they did not do anything. They simply blew trumpets and they marched around the city. When they were tired on the seventh day, when they had marched seven times on the seventh day, when they were tired, God gave them victory. So it was God's battle. And the instruction was anything that save two things, save Harab, uh, uh, Rahab and her family, and the rest, all the spoils belong to the Lord. All of them. Don't do anything. They will be used in the temple. Don't take anything. You will take from other cities that you are going to, that you are going to, eat, but don't take anything from here. Now the story says, um, this gentleman, Achan, stole, stole some of the, some, some of the articles. He stole a robe. He stole some, uh, uh, some pieces of gold, uh, silver, and, and he hid them in his, uh, in his uh, tent. You all know the story. They were defeated because sin was committed. And you all know the story. And then they discovered that he was actually the person who stole. Now, this, the, the, the lesson is any sin that has been committed by one member has a way of impacting the whole nation and has a way of impacting negatively even the very family, the, the, the family of the person, the person who committed that sin. Now, so, so the, the story ended in a sad way where the Israelites, because of what Achan did, they stoned him together with his family. And they made a heap of stones on him, on them, on the, whole, the, the rest of the family. And that was the end of Achan. That was the end of Achan. Now, let's look at the two stories. Here's a story of Rahab. She's in Jericho. She fears the Lord because of the stories that she had, she had heard. On the other side, you have Achan, who's, who is a part of the story. He is among the Israelites. He's part of the story. He lives, he subsists, subsists on miracles. He lives on manna. He lives on God's miracles every day. Every day he sees the cloud on them. Or in the evening, at night, he would see the fire of the Lord leading them to warm them, warm them by night. So he's a child of miracles. On the other side, in Jericho, they are afraid of God. But with Achan, he steals from God. While living on miracles, he steals from God. And at the end of the story, of the two stories, Rahab becomes, Rahab together with her family, are accepted as the family of Israel. They join Israel. But Achan and his family are deleted. I mean, they are no more there. So in, it, it sounds like their place was taken by Rahab and her family because of her obedience, because of her fear of the God she did not even know. But Achan disrespected the God who sustained him, who liberated him from, from Egypt. He came all the way when he got to the borders of Canaan, he lost it. But then here is a person who had no, who, who, who was living in Jericho. Here is a lady living her own life, but listening to all these stories that were told, listening to everything. And she decided never to trust Jericho, its military. She decided to trust the God of Israel. She accepted the God of Israel. She wanted to be part of that community. Now, the two stories. Now, you can look at the story and say, this man steals, this is Achan. He steals, and the family does not know, but then the family is also destroyed. And they, they had nothing to do with that sin. On the other side, here's the story of Rahab. She does something good. She harbored the slave, the, 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 the spies, and, and she believed in the God of Israel. And, and they made a promise that we will save you together with her family. Her family did not, know, did not know about this arrangement because she needed to keep it because it was treason against the, 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 the city of Jericho. So it was her kept secret. 
but they benefited from that. Now you can look at the story of, of Akhan and say, it was unfair for the family to, to suffer this when they had no choice. And you look at the other story, she made a choice, she made a decision, she believed in the God that she did not know. She just heard the stories and she believed this God. And because she believed her family was saved, family that did not even know that she had harbored this faith. So these are the two stories. And I want to suggest to you that these stories are not there, are not placed in the book of Joshua by mistake. It's not a mistake that we have the two stories. I want to suggest to you that there's these two stories are telling the story of Adam and Eve. Adam and also the story of Jesus Christ. So remember, we read a passage that says, Adam, in, in Romans chapter 5, verse 19, Adam disobeyed God and caused many others to be sinners. We read that passage, Romans 5, verse 19. Adam disobeyed God and caused many others to be sinners. But Jesus obeyed him and will make many people acceptable to God. Here are the, here's the story again that looks like the story of Joshua chapter 2 and Joshua chapter 7. We have Adam who disobeyed God and caused everyone, including us, we are born separated from God because of what Adam did. We, when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, we also sinned in their loins because we are part of that family. So we are born separated from God. We disobeyed when they disobeyed. We disobeyed because we are part of that family. But now notice, notice something else, but Jesus obeyed him and will make many people acceptable to God. Here's another Adam, the, the, uh, Paul calls him the second Adam, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ obeyed and by his obedience, everyone is made acceptable to God. Here are two stories. We fall in Adam where we had no choice, no choice whatsoever. He sinned and he sinned, he sinned for us and we are affected by that sin. But then here's Jesus Christ who came and obeyed and lived a righteous life. And because of that, because of his sinlessness and because of living the righteous life, we are now given this story we are given this righteousness. We are, we, we are given the history of not sinning. We receive this history and it is credited to us. We are now a new people because now we have been saved. We, we disobeyed in Adam, but we are saved in Jesus Christ. So the two stories in the book of Joshua are not there by mistake. They are there to teach us what Adam did on our behalf, which caused us to lose or to disobey God. And what Christ did when he was on this earth, he lived a sinless life and he died at the cross to take our place to be our substitute. So no one will be punished because of what Adam did because the cross paid the price. We now have a choice to remain in this family. We now have a new history the history of Adam ended at the cross. The history of disobedience ended at the cross. We now have a new history, the history of righteousness inherited from the obedience and the righteous life of Jesus Christ. So our choices, we, did, we could not choose in Adam in the Garden of Eden. We had no choice. But now we have a choice. Our choices have been restored. We now have a new family. We have a new history of righteousness. But now sin, the, 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 the sin is still powerful. Satan is still working. We still need to battle with the issues. We still face the difficulties. That's why we meet here and pray. We are, see, we are actually admitting that the battle is still on. And we have been promised that one day, in a twinkle of an eye, we will be changed when Jesus Christ comes. And this body that is wearing corruption will wear incorruption. It will be incorruptible and we will be changed, we'll be like him. And until then, until then, Paul is saying, oh, wretched man I am, 
who's going to save me from this wretched, wretched, wretchedness? I try the good that I try to do, I find myself not doing, but the evil that I try to avoid, I find myself doing it. This is Romans chapter 12. And, 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 and Paul is actually admitting that we are still battling, we're still here. So the power of sin is still here, but the power of grace is still there to rescue us from, we have been rescued from the penalty of sin at the cross. The penalty that was to be meted because we sinned in Adam in the Garden of Eden, but we're still dealing with the power of sin. And Christ is working with us both to will and to want to be saved. And we need to be part of this. We need to be part of this wondrous grace. We need to be part of Jesus Christ, part of this winning story. And one day when Jesus comes, we will sit with him and he will tell us why he allowed all these things. But the story is almost over. If you look at the prophecies that are there, Almost 95% of prophecies have been fulfilled. Very few prophecies are still to be fulfilled, including the prophecy of the second coming of Jesus Christ. And until then, let's remain faithful. Let's, let's continue to choose this family of grace, not the family of disobedience. And may God bless us this morning. May God give us strength. May he sustain us until that time when he appears and we are changed in a twinkle of an eye, then we are like Jesus. And may God bless us all this morning. Amen. Amen. Amen, my pastor. Please pray for us. Okay, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for these stories that are scary, but they point us to what you have done for us. And thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ, who restored a choice for us. And this morning we come to you, Lord. We pray that the Holy Spirit will dwell with us, that the Father will, will, be, will, will put a hedge around us, and that the grace of Jesus Christ, the power of Jesus Christ to conquer sin may dwell in us so that, Lord, we can live a victorious life. And, Lord, keep us, sustain us, and meet our needs and, and, and forgive us, Father, where we have sinned against you and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we thank you for hearing our prayer. And we believe that once we have asked Jesus and we have paid, paid, put Jesus on our prayers, we believe that the answer is going to be yes. Therefore, Lord, we can as well praise you for answering our prayers through the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen, my pastor. Disobedient in Adam and saved in Jesus.